We're going to move forward. Today, I get the, get the joy and the privilege of introducing uh, my friend Dave Hopewell, who is uh, one of the pastors at Grace Point in Brookings. He is also um, our, one of our district missions directors. And so really excited to hear what he has to say in his heart uh, for you this morning. So would you welcome uh, Pastor Dave Hopewell? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I was making sure the mic worked. Um, my name is Dave Hopewell. Uh, I am from Grace Point Wesleyan. Uh, I'll share a little bit more about myself as today continues, but I have a beautiful wife. We've been married for about nine years and have three amazing kids. Uh, my oldest son is three. He'll be four in November, and I have two beautiful daughters. They will be two in September. Uh, so our house is a little crazy. We have three kids, three and under right now. Um, and ho hopefully I'll share a little bit more about them as we go into this. And I, I have a, a small confession to make. Um, I was really excited when Kirby had asked for people to come and uh, kind of talk a little bit this morning. I had this grand idea on this illustration that I was going to give you guys. Um, and the, the funny thing is that none of it worked out the way that I planned it to be. So today, we're going to talk about be anxious for nothing. Um, I think it's, it's funny because anxiety has been very present um, in my life, in my family. And I, I even think in our culture, as more and more people are becoming more and more aware of it. So I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about it this morning. Uh, so this summer, I was fortunate enough to lead a team of four people to Africa. And I was very excited about this trip. Um, but the weeks leading up to this trip, my wife uh, was a little bit off and how she, was, she wasn't feeling great, she was getting very tired. Um, and for some of you know, these are, these are early signs that something might be going on inside of her. Uh, and so the weekend before I leave for Africa, she's like, Dave, I, I think I need to take a pregnancy test. Um, now, though we have three kids, this is, this is kind of foreign to us because we actually weren't able to conceive naturally the first three times we went through the IVF process. Um, and so this was like, so exciting for us, but then at this point I was like, okay, is this a real thing or not? And so uh, she took the test and we found out uh, that we're pregnant with our fourth child uh, due in January. And so it was, uh, we were just so exhilarated and excited for this opportunity. So we found out we were pregnant and then I said, okay, I'll be back in two weeks. Um, <laughs> so, so I left my, my pregnant wife with three kids alone for two weeks right after we found out. So she is a, a very strong, uh, courageous woman in this. So when I get back from Africa, um, we look at each other and had some serious conversations about, okay, now what are we going to do? Our, our house is about 900 square feet. We, we made three bedrooms and we made it work with the three kids that we had. And we said, we might need to look at getting a bigger house. And so we decided to uh, start the house hunting process and put our house on the market. Uh, and so this is where everything kind of stems from today. Of, uh, if you've ever sold a house, it is, a, it is an exhausting process. Um, it caused so much anxiety and worry in my life. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to use this example, and it's going to be perfect when I go down to Madison. Um, but we haven't sold our house yet. Uh, and so I feel like God is, is still working in me the very things that I'm going to talk about today. So I'm excited to journey through uh, this with you guys today as, as God has been forming this in my life. Um, so one of the, the verses that he's really laid on my heart is Psalms 139. Um, in the end of it. So I'm, I'm going to read this real fast, and this will kind of set us up for where we're going to go today. Psalms 139, um, the very end of it says, Search me, God, know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And so, obviously, whenever I have these anxious moments, this is the prayer that I would lift up. And I'd say, God, know my anxious thoughts. Um, you know, take them away from me, and it would become a kind of a, a prayer of lament of like, okay, I'm, I'm ready, get me out of this, let's, let's keep going, like God just continue to show up in big ways. Um, and so as we were kind of going through this, I realized that um, anxiety has been very present in the, even in the midst of our family, um, in our life, and I, and I feel like culture has been continually faced by this. And so it's been, it's been interesting for me as going through this to, to get the perspectives of the other people that are going around me to say, hey, how do you, how do, you deal with this? What does this look like in your life? And what are, what are some ways that we can begin dealing with this? Um, just ask people some practical ways. And so I think it would be a miss to, to start talking about worry and anxiety without actually setting some ground loops. Like, what, what, is, what is worry? And so I, some of you guys have note guides. Um, I want you to take a second and create a working definition. If you were to explain worry, 
Uh, my three-year-old son, he's asking great questions right now. And he asks me, what is this? How would you explain it to a child? How would you explain worry to a child, whether through one word or just a sentence? Um, and this is the part where I'm going to actually ask you guys to respond. Um, so I don't know how responsive everybody is here, but um, if you, what came to your mind? How would you define worry? Useless thought. I like that. That's very good. How else? Well, lack of faith. Good. Lack of faith. Good. How else? What else, how else would, you, would you describe worry to even a three-year-old? Stress. Stress. It's so stressful. Anything else? Any other thing? Fear? Good. My fear is really good. Nervous. Nervous. Yeah, there's a lot of emotions that get involved with just anxiety and worry that's in our life. Um, one definition that I read that I, that I really liked, um, it kind of falls in line with, um, with how Matthew begins to explain it. Um, but it says, uh, the thoughts of something that may happen in the future. And I think that, that whole concept of may uh, is kind of a big part of it. Because sometimes in the midst of our worry, we think it's a guarantee that it's going to happen. But I think settling on the, that this may happen is the, the uh, unknown of what worry really leads us to. And so as I was kind of studying, it's, it's easy to throw verses at, at worry. Uh, when we begin worrying, we, we, we read to, through Scripture. Um, so a couple of them that, that come up that you've probably heard, you know, Matthew 6 at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, do not worry about your life. Uh, in Philippians 4, 6, it says, be anxious for nothing. And so it's easy to begin throwing some of these Scriptures to it and say, okay, God, let me, let me think about these things, and then my worry and my fears are going to go away. Uh, one of the things that I thought was unique as I was studying this is the New Testament word that was continuously used um, for worry. It's the Greek word. Um, I'm going to try to pronounce it. It's a merma, mernanmo. I've been practicing that all week. Um, so if you know Greek and I didn't say it right, don't tell me. Um, but I'm going to assume most of you don't know Greek, so that's how it's said. Um, but when it's used in the New Testament, it's used um, for, for simple sayings of uh, to be anxious, to be distracted, or to have a divided mind. And when I was reading through that, when I read to have a divided mind, I thought that summarized what anxiety felt like in my very life, is that I have my, the life that I'm living, the life that I'm supposed to be living is one way, but then when I have these fears and these anxieties and these worries, my mind is completely split, and all I can do is think and focus about the thing that's ahead of me. So I feel like I'm living two lives of the, the circumstance that I'm consumed with or just the regular daily life that I'm going about. And I think it's important to begin uh, to realize what, what it would look like to have this demi- divided mind in our life. And I feel like we begin separating ourselves from how we should be doing to what we're actually doing. And so the, the next question that God really prompted me with, he said, is, is worry a sin? And I, uh, I hated writing that down in my notes today because I was like, oh, I got a, a lot of things I need to ask for forgiveness if it is because there's, there's small moments in my life where I feel like I just, I become concerned. I become worried about specific things. And so as, as I was studying this, I was, I was like, hopefully it's like not all that bad, but maybe it's a little bad if I'm like too consumed with it. Um, and so I had to dive into scripture a little bit to kind of to see what, what the Bible says about worry and concern. And I, I was brought a little bit of hope when I was going through 1 Corinthians. And Paul simply says, um, it's okay to have a deep concern for the people that are around us. But I feel like there's this progress from health, healthy concern and worry to unhealthy concern. So I'm going to give you my non-scientific um, study of the transition from healthy to unhealthy. And I just, uh, this study came upon asking my friends and family in the past couple of weeks of, well, what does it look like to transition uh, in, this, in this form of concern and worry? So um, I love to backpack. I love hiking. I love getting out into the woods. Uh, with kids, it makes it a little bit harder. But as you get out into the woods, imagine yourself camping. And if you were to run into a bear or a buffalo. My hope is that there would be a little bit of concern that strikes up in your heart that says, I probably shouldn't keep going closer. And so the concern is hopefully going to create this fight or flight instinct. And if you're with a friend, I'm hoping that you can run faster than to get away um, to safe ground. If you're with your kids, you should probably take them with you. Um, but, but to some degree, concern is a good thing because it creates safety in our life. 
Um, like I said earlier, I have two beautiful daughters. Uh, they're turning two next month. Uh, and I am concerned for the day that they want to date. Um, it, it will be 21, because we'll have pretty strict rules in our house that they will follow. Uh, but I'm concerned for them. I'm concerned for the, the, the guy that they bring home. What kind of guy is this going to be like? Does he have good Christian character? Is he going to take care of the very thing that I spent 21 years raising in my life? And it, so, so I think that on the, on the front side of it, concern is okay. But then once we start to take these actions and this movement from concern is when it gets a little tricky. And so one of the things I've realized is we start to control the situations. So with my, with my girls, I'm going to be creating very strict rules that they have to follow if they do decide to go out on a date, that uh, the car that they are picked up in probably has to have four doors and a good working engine. Um, they have to be home by 10 o'clock. You have to go to you know, a decent restaurant, and you must open the doors. And I'm just going to start creating these rules and this list to, for me to, to try to control the situation as best as I can. But then from this control and these, these rules standpoint, um, the next set of actions that I'm probably going to take is that once they leave the house, I'm probably going to jump into my minivan, stay about a mile behind, know where they go, and I'm going to stay outside, watch him the whole time, just to make sure uh, that he's treating her well. He's opening the door, that he's paying for dinner, that he's not doing anything that he shouldn't do. Um, and I'm going to be there watching. And I, I think when we start turning from concerned to being utterly consumed with the situation that's at hand is when we start turning from healthy to unhealthy. And so the, the, three, the three stages that I'll lay out, and I explain them kind of in my stories, we, we start with the concern. It's kind of the first stage. You know, it's, it's okay to have that slight concern. And then we go to this area where we're, we're going to control the situation as best as we can. And sometimes we create lists and rules, whether they're spoken or unspoken in our lives, to kind of control the situation, um, whatever's at hand. And then we get to this place where we are just utterly consumed. That's all that we can think about. That's the only thing that's on our mind with what uh, the problem or the circumstance is. And I think we're walking through a place from health to unhealth. And then it's, it's easy to, to kind of throw, throw verses into it. And I, I love in Matthew, it says, um, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And I feel like sometimes when we begin to worry we begin to, to have this brick wall that's right in front of us where we are just utterly consumed, and I, I can't see past the brick wall. But I, I don't think worrying is like a switch. I don't think we can just simply turn it off and turn it on. I don't think we have that much control of it, because I, I think it's, it's rooted more deeply inside of us than just saying, okay, you know, I prayed the verse in Matthew, I'm done worrying, I'm good to go now. I think there's, there's more to it that we really need to dive in to take a deeper look into it. So my hopes this morning is to begin taking this perspective where we can become consumed by the worry and the anxieties in our life, by those circumstances, and, and we can begin to take a, a bigger perspective about what God really wants us to do when we're faced with these moments. And so I want to take a look back at Psalms 139 a little bit, and um, as I was reading through that verse this summer, a lot of it just didn't make sense to me. So I had to take the step back and I had to just read through the whole thing to get the bigger perspective and say, okay, God, what, what do you really want me to glean um, from this passage? So let's take a look at the first part of it. It says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit, you know when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. And I think there's some pretty cool characteristics and attributes of God that we can call out in this first part of the Psalms. And I think that the, the, the number one thing that we can say is God knows everything. He knows everything. And this can be comforting to some of us, but it can also be kind of terrifying if you really start to think about this. Uh, my wife is very emotionally intelligent, and I am not. So whenever we get into a fight, and she, she can sense it written all over me. She's like, Dave, are you mad? No. <laughs> but she knows. She knows that I'm upset. And then she wants to talk about it. Why are you mad? I'm not mad. But she knows that I'm a little upset. And what makes me frustrated is, 
Even if I were to say that I am mad, I don't even know what I'm mad about most of the time. It's probably because I didn't have my coffee in the morning or I had to clean up a poopy diaper in the morning or just something happened that offset my morning. So I'm at this place where she's asking me and I, I just don't know. And you know what's, what's more concerning? Is that God simply says, he says it in this first part. He says, I know, I know you. I know when you sit, I know when you rise, I perceive your, thought, my, your thoughts from afar. So we have a God that we can come into prayer and we might not know the right words to say. And sometimes it's being present. He's going to say, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're feeling and it's okay. And so in these moments of anxiousness that we feel, God comes and he says, just simply come to me because I know. And the next thing that we can push into is the the second stanza in in the Psalms where he says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee your presence? So the second attribute of God that we should be able to call out is God is everywhere. God is everywhere. He's he's the the all-knowing. He's around everything. He surrounds us. He's all-present. He's infinite. He's boundless. These characteristics are amazing to think that there is nowhere that you can run from God. Okay, so here's my question. How many of you guys like to play hide and seek? Thank you. I was hoping I'd get some hands raised. Hide and seek. I am really good at hide and seek. I'm so good. I know the best places in our house, behind the couch, under the beds, in the closets. Like, I'm a mastermind at hide and seek. So I know how to get away from the things, especially when my kids are looking for me. You got to start making like little chirps. They find you. It's kind of actually nice to get a little rest while you're hiding if you're really good at it. (laughs) And my hopes are some of you parents like hide and seek as well, like hide and seek. Um, Sometimes that's when I said, okay, kids, let's go play. And I finish my cup of coffee for the morning and then I can go find them when it's, when it's time. So kids, keep hiding. Find, those, find the best hiding spots that you can. And I assure you, your parents will find you at some point during the morning. <laughs> Do you know what the worst part about hide and seek is? Is we, when you know where the best hiding spot is and somebody's already there. Under the bed, there's, there's somebody already hiding under there. And if you only have 20 seconds, where else do you go? Do you hide with them? Do you find somewhere else? So when we begin to understand this attribute of God, that God is everywhere. Sometimes when we we retreat from the things that are daunting us and we go to the place, our secret, our hiding place, and God's already waiting for us there. It could be very frustrating at times, but we should also be able to draw comfort in that because he's simply saying, I've gone before you. I will pursue you. I know where you're going to be, and I will be there with you. He's not going to leave us. He's not going to forsake us. But he's there in our very own hiding spaces, ready to meet us with whatever is going on. And the third part in the Psalms dives into this. And I, I hope that you can receive this well this morning. This was a verse that came to me in college, and I utterly hated it because it didn't make sense to me. So Psalms 139, 13 says, For you created my inmost beings, You knit me together in my mother's rooms. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. Number three is, God brought it all into existence. He brought it all into existence. He is the creator. He's the author of life. He's the maker. What a powerful attribute of God that we can call out. This means that you are not a mistake. You were created on purpose. Now there's, there's things that I've heard, and we can become accidental parents, but there are no accidental children. God knew full well what he was doing when each one of you were created. And beyond that, he, he goes and says in Genesis that not only were you created, but you were created in his image. We are created in his, in his image so that we can be his image bearer into the world. Man, that's a calling on your life. How are you being the image bearer in the world that is around you? I feel like once we start to call out these different attributes God is everywhere. He knows everything, and he brought everything into existence. That our lives should hopefully fundamentally change. 
So then what, what do we begin to do when we face these moments of anxieties and fears? And uh, I want to dive into the last part of this Psalms because it's, it's not what I expected when I dove into it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the, the, the whole last part of it for you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your names. I do not hate those who hate you, Lord. I abhor those who are in rebellion against you. I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God, know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. All summer, I was reading the psalm as a psalm of lament. I said, God, know my thoughts. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I can't do this anymore. Take me out of this. Just get my anxious thoughts away. But when I read through this last part, David isn't, he's not lamenting. He's like angry. He's saying, God, like, I don't like the people who don't like you. Like, let, let's go. Let's take care of these people right now. Saying, test me. No anxious thoughts. I'm, he's gearing up for battle right now. He's not sitting back in a corner saying, I'm just, I'm nervous. What's going to happen next? He's on the front line saying, okay, who's ready? Whoever's against you, I'm against. Let's do this. What does it look like when we, we begin to take a different attitude when worry and anxieties are in our life? This isn't a pity party that he's a part of, but it's a simple battle cry. And you know what bothers me even more about the last part? Is when he says, test me. That was the one part all summer that I, I couldn't read. I couldn't read the test me, no my anxious thoughts. Because in college, I, I was doing pretty good in my spiritual formation. Spiritual formation. I felt like I was, had a pretty good relationship with God. And I was like, you know what, God? Like, test me this year. I'm ready for it. It was the hardest year of my college career. Every relationship I had, every family member that I was a part of, all the things that I thought that I was good at completely stumbled. I felt very distant from God that whole year. Why would I want to pray that prayer again? Look at how God has tested people through the Bible. Pastor, Pastor Nathan last week talks about Jesus spending 40 days in the desert and being tested by Satan at the very end of it. Why would you, why would you ask that upon yourself? Look at Abraham and Isaac. I, I wouldn't want to put my son on, on an altar. Why, why would you ask God to test you? But I think that the thing that I noticed that David's doing in the midst of this is he realizes, like he's, he's on the, how many of you guys like football? Football? Yeah, okay, so, so God's quarterback, he's making the call, he's telling people what's going on. David's receiving the call, and he's reiterating. God's like, okay, go for the Hail Mary, and David's like, Hail Mary, I'm ready, test me. He, he's, he says, give me the ball, that's what he's saying. He's saying, test me, I'm ready, give me the ball, game point, I'm ready to go, I'm gonna run as hard as I can. He's not sitting on the sideline saying, I don't, I don't know if I want the ball on the final point. I'm a little nervous right now. No, David's saying, come on, it's my time. Let's do this because I know that you're by my side. And so it completely changes how we look at this idea. The simple truth, you ready for this? Is whether or not you ask it, God is going to test you. David is simply affirming the test that's going to come his way. So this isn't, this isn't a psalm of a man, but this is a psalm of a battle cry of, let's get out, let's take care of this thing, let's do this. All right, so my big takeaway this, this morning is simply this. God is bigger than our circumstances. He is much bigger than our circumstances. And we have these amazing attributes of God that we get to call out in our moments where we, we may have our face down moments when the, whatever the circumstance is right in front of our face and this is all that we can see. God wants us to be able to put down the book and say you are bigger than the circumstances that we might be facing. And so I have a couple, a couple applications that I want to give to you guys as we leave here today. A couple of big things that I think we should be able to um, just begin to apply in our lives. The first one is are, are we becoming consumed with the things of God? Are we having a divided mind and we have two different things that are going on? Or are we allowing the things of God just to consume our life so that our circumstances aren't, aren't defining the way that we go? Are you taking that split second and just praying about the things that you might be tested with? Are you afraid and fearful of what the test is going to be? Because if you are, it's, it's still going to come. And we have to be willing to say, God, test me because I'm on the front lines with you. We need to begin turning our worry into prayer. 
And what, my, my wife is, she's, she's amazing. And she literally made this whole point for me without even realizing it. We, we were talking about things in the moving process, and she's starting, work starting to get crazy again. And um, on Friday night, she goes, Dave, I, just, I was just really anxious. So I, played, I prayed through Philippians. It says, do not be anxious for anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request, request to God. Now, whenever I read that, I would say prayer and petition. I'm going to face down prayer, and I'm just going to say, God, like, help me. Let's get away from this. And she goes, no. Like, so what I did is I just listed all the things that I was thankful for. So she spent 20 minutes just saying, you know, I'm thankful for all these things in my life. Because what happens is when we become so focused on the situation that's at hand, we become so narrow-minded, and we, re- we think that we're the only thing that matters. And I think that goes against everything that God wants from us. He says, the situation's way bigger than you. I guarantee you somebody else has it harder. And when we become so locked into what we're doing, we become insulated. We don't let other people in. We become self-righteous and self-focused. And God's saying, that's the last thing that I want from you. So what does it look like to begin to turn our thoughts to the thanksgiving, the things that are around us? Because there's, I guarantee you, you have a lot of things to be thankful for. And maybe it's spending five, 10 minutes just writing down the little things in our life that we can be thankful for to get out of our self-consuming world where it's all about us. And I think the, the real thing that we need to look at about having a divided mind is even in, in Proverbs 4, it says, above all else, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. Know your heart, know your mind. When these anxious thoughts come in, it's okay to have those concerns, but we need to be able to identify them, to turn them away, to be able to guard our hearts so that we can live the, the, the Imago Dei, the, the you're created in his image, so we can be his image bearer to the world, so we can begin living this out in the lives of the people that are around us. Because you have, you are influencers in your communities, in your workplace, in your families. And we become insulated with our concerns and worries. We forget about the people that are around us. I think we need to be able to be concerned about those that are around us. And so I have three reflection questions that I want to leave you with, and they're, they're, they're in your bulletin. Um, so you can take these, and you can either write something down to it now or, or with, your fr- with your family at dinner, talk about them. Maybe it's on your drive. Um, it, maybe it's personal prayer time. But reflect through these questions this week, and now allow this to set your tone by asking God, how do I rid myself of these things? So number one is, what is the circumstance that you're facing What's the circumstance? Do you, do you have a face down moment right now that you're just saying, God, just take me out of this? And what if instead of saying, take me out of this, it says, take me through this. Allow me to give you glory through this circumstance. No, question number two is, what is your mind consumed with? What is it that's just burning inside you that you, you have this divided mind that you just can't get over it? And number three is, what are you trying to control that you shouldn't be? What are the rules and the actions that, whether you've communicated or not, that you're trying to list to have control over something where God's simply saying, you need to let it go. You need to let it go. You need need to let me have control. Know that I, I know everything, that I am everywhere. Then I brought everything into existence. And if we can call those attributes out, to God, we know that he's going to help push us through no matter what the outcome is going to look like. So I just want to close with a quick word of prayer and then Pastor Kirby's going to come back out and, and let us go. So would you please bow your heads with me today? God, thank you for today. Thank you for the hard times, for the anxieties and the worries that we have because I know that you wouldn't put Abraham through what he did with Isaac without purpose. Because you want to see a renewed life, a transformed life inside of us. So that we can be reminded that we are created in your very image. So that we can be your image bearers to the world that's around us that that is just as hurting and as broken as we are. But the one thing that we have inside of our hearts is you that they may not have. So for us being an image bearer, that we can, we can endure the hardships of life and still have joy and still have hope. 
so that we can be able to embed that into our families, into our friends, into our workplaces, where they may not have that very thing. They may have things going on that are twice as hard as we have. But because we know that you're everywhere and that you know everything, we can, we can spread your love into the lives of the people that are around us. So I pray for whatever situations that we're facing today in this room. Some may be huge that we don't feel like we can step over. God, that we can just, we can speak your presence into it. We can reflect on some of the verses that you've given us today, but most of all, we can call the attributes and your promises into those moments because God, we realize that you're bigger than any circumstance we can ever face. We thank you and we love you. We pray all this in your name. Amen.